a special anniversary for Adventist Mission and a village off the southeast coast of Africa. That and so much more coming up right here on Global Mission Snapshots. Just before he went up to heaven, Jesus gave us a command. He gave us a mission. Jesus said, go, go unto all the world, telling them of his love. This is our mission. This is our global mission. Hello and welcome to Global Mission Snapshots. I'm Gary Krauss. On today's program, we'll be talking with Nancy Kite, Marketing Director for the Office of Adventist Mission. Nancy recently traveled to the island nation of Madagascar, where she visited a church made up of people from an outcast tribe. We'll also talk with her about something that happened 100 years ago that's still impacting mission today. The very first 13th Sabbath offering took place in 1912. But even before that, there was a project that inspired these offerings. It was a collection to carry the gospel to the descendants of the mutiny on the bounty on Pitcairn Island. But first, let's head for Siberia. I have a friend. Her name is Alicia, and she invited me to this group. Some time ago, my house was damaged in a fire, and the church helped me rebuild part of it, and I decided that I would like to have this house dedicated to God and to serve Him. So for the past year, I have been inviting a small group to come and meet in my house. Alicia lives in the town of Krasnoyarsk, deep in the heart of Siberia. Life here can be cold, and for the small number of Seventh-day Adventists that make their homes here, reaching out to others has not been easy. But then, a new approach was taken, one that has proven to be successful. At our church, we were discussing ways that we can share our love for God and our friendship with others. One of my friends suggested that we have a small group meeting. Because of our group, now Ruslan and Margarita are the fruits of our meetings, and I am so happy that they have joined us. Ruslan is the newest member of the group to join the church, and he started attending the group for a specific reason. I came to this group because they were studying the Bible. Now God is my life and my friend. Getting a small group established isn't an easy task, so the group was thankful for some help in the beginning. When we started our group, our pastor, Vladimir, joined us and it helped to get us going. It was very helpful. This group is successful because they are united and are like a family. They help each other and I am sure that if something were to happen to one of them, the others would support them and help each other grow spiritually. The members of this group have been changed through their new friendships as well as the continual study of the Holy Scriptures. God has changed me a lot because before I never used to listen to other people's opinions. I was selfish and everything was my way. But when I went to church and got to know God, I can now listen to people and consider their opinions. Small group evangelism has been proven to be successful all over the world. For many, it is the best way to truly grow the church and build strong congregations. I am sure that this model of outreach is one of the best ways to reach people and grow as a church. People become like a family and their relationships help to unify the church. The church members who started the small group are happy that they have found a way to reach out to those people in their community who are searching for the truth. For Ruslan and Margarita, their lives have been touched by people who are willing to let them into their church family. I am so happy that they have found the truth. They both used to be different people, but now their lives have purpose. I used to be the same way, but when I found God, my life changed. Your mission offerings 
will help provide a new church building for the Seventh-day Adventist members in Krasnoyarsk. Currently, they have to rent public buildings so that their members can meet each Sabbath. This new church will provide a stable place of worship where they can invite their friends and families to worship. Please keep the members in Krasnoyarsk in your prayers as you give your mission offerings this Sabbath. Well, from Siberia, we now travel to the somewhat warmer climates of Africa, and my guest is Nancy Kite. Nancy, thanks for joining us. Now, you're the marketing director for Adventist Mission, and recently you visited Madagascar. I guess that's how you pronounce it. Yes. Uh, describe this island. Madagascar is a beautiful island. It wasn't quite as developed as I thought it would be. Uh, people there work extremely hard just to make a living and just to survive from one day to the next. You find a lot of people just doing subsistence works or subsistence farming just to stay alive. Mm. And the life expectancy isn't all that long, uh, maybe around 53. Wow. So if I had lived there under those circumstances, I would be long gone by now. Wow. Well, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> a little while. Yeah. Well, that's that's you know this is a challenge in many parts of the developing world now. Madagascar is French speaking, a former French colony, I guess. Yes. Now describe the Seventh Day Adventist Church's presence. Well, the presence there is actually larger than I expected, and it has been growing quite a bit. And while we were there, we had a chance to visit a church. It was a new church. It had only been built for maybe a couple of months. It was in the south part of the island. So we went down to see this church, which had been started originally by a global mission pioneer. So he had been sent to this area specifically to make friends in the area and um, offered Bible studies to those who were interested. Hmm. Uh, he went to a very difficult people group, though. Now. You describe them as an outcast tribe. What do you mean by that? Well, it so happens that centuries ago, um, there were some superstitions that um, meant that this particular people group were the, were the descendants of only um, one human and not two humans. Oh. And so there was, there's a lot of disgrace and discrimination about that. So this group, they live in isolation, although they can go out and, and join the community and for work and that sort of thing. So it's almost like they're a lower caste Exactly, oh, that's exactly. Tough. So the Global Mission Pioneer went there and established this congregation. Describe the church, the building. Well, the church was very interesting and uh, we had a little opening ceremony there and uh, I was talking with some of the members afterwards and I said, well, now how did this church get built? Did you have, you know, you hire someone to build it? And they immediately went to chattering among themselves because they did not hire anyone. They all did the work themselves. In mm. other words, for the foundation where the concrete of the church was, the, the floor, they all hiked by foot and went to the mountain and chipped out rocks by oh. hand, carried them on their heads, and brought them into the village and mixed them with cement, and that laid the foundation. Um, they also used about 250 ravenella trees. Now, a ravenella tree is similar to a banana tree, only you know it, it fans out like this. 250 of those trees they cut to take care of the walls and that sort of thing. So mm. incredible amount of labor, but they did it knowing that it was going to be their first church in that area. Mm, amazing. Now, did you actually meet the Global Mission Pioneer? I did. Describe him. He's a young man, um, not married that long. His wife is also young and they have a little baby. Um, I think he, even he was surprised at how fast the work was growing because they started just, you know, with a handful of people and that group soon jumped to like 22 and then 50. So I think even he was surprised at how fast um, the work was taking on, how much interest there actually was in learning about the Bible and learning about a God who gives everyone dignity. Mm, very important. Now, when the pioneer went there, did, did he talk about how he started the work? I mean, how, did, did he, had he come from that area himself? No. No, he was not from that area, but he moved into the area and um, started with activities for children, you know, games after school and that sort of thing, uh. and then became acquainted with the parents and you know, offered to teach lessons from the Bible if they were interested. And since he was new and, and they, he was a person that had an attractive personality, they liked him mm. um, and they recognized that he was an educated person 
and they wanted to learn from him. So it kind of started from there. Um, and also along with the support of a nearby Adventist church that was established in the next city over. Okay, very so good. So we got a lot of support from them. Good, good, good. Now, perhaps we should back up because there may be some of our viewers who don't know what a global mission pioneer is. Can you describe what a global mission pioneer is? Yes, a global mission pioneer is a person who works as a missionary within his or her own culture. There are some places where it doesn't work very well, or it's not as effective if a foreign person comes in to work in that area. So a pioneer already knows the language, he um, knows the customs, um, the traditions, and it's, it's a lot faster, a lot, it's a lot easier for them to make inroads into a community. Yeah, and they, because they speak the language and they know the culture, they know what they should say and what they shouldn't say. Exactly. And it always humbles me when I visit these pioneers because they're not living in luxury. I mean, mo No, they are not. In fact, uh, we went to the pioneer's home uh, and shared a meal that, he, that his wife had prepared and pitch dark, mm. you know, very little light but there isn't much light in the neighborhood either, so they live the very same way. So for us, it seemed a little bit precarious to go down the path in the darkness and find our way into um, his home. But they were lovely hosts, mm. and I found the people in Madagascar themselves to be extremely friendly and kind, especially considering the hard day-to-day -day life that most of them seem to have. Exactly. Now, are there any large cities at all in Madagascar, or is it all rural? Most of it seems to be rural from what we saw, and it seemed like there weren't a lot of intersecting highways. Right. In other words, you get on the road and you drive and drive and drive, and then uh, the next day you turn around and come back. At least that's the, the route that we took. Wow. Um, but such a beautiful country, so, so full of natural beauty, yeah. It was lovely to see. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, for sharing with us today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. It. And viewers at home, uh, please remember Global Mission pioneers working around the world, sometimes in very, very difficult circumstances. And remember the people in Madagascar as they learn about Jesus and his love for him, for, for everybody, and that he came and died for them. Don't go away, we'll be coming back in just a few seconds to talk about a very important mission anniversary. Some 50 years ago, Adventist missionaries spent 40 days traversing the rough jungles of Papua New Guinea to reach out to people who had never before heard the name of Jesus. They healed the sick, fed the poor and provided spiritual healing to God's children. Today, this same trip can be done in 15 minutes, thanks to a mission plane that was paid for with your mission offerings. The mode of transportation may have changed, but the message of hope in Jesus is still the same. Welcome back. Nancy Kite is still with me to talk about a very important anniversary this year, which is? It is the 100th anniversary of the 13th Sabbath mission offering. Okay, now the 13th Sabbath offering is familiar to Seventh-day Adventists. Um, describe it for some of our viewers who may not have heard of it before. It is a special offering that is collected at the end of each quarter. So in other words, the 13th Sabbath, uh, once a quarter, and that offering goes to fund new projects. Uh, in other words, work that isn't already being supported by other offerings in the church. Okay, and so this is a special mission project, but sometimes it can be to help refurbish a mission hospital or something like that. Sure, yeah. yes. Now, I mentioned earlier that the, the real beginnings of Seventh-day Adventist mission offerings go right back 
to the pit can. Uh, describe that for us and, and the offering that was collected. Well, the offering that was collected it was actually quite historical. Now, the Adventist Church had been sending offerings for mission projects previously, but this was the first time that they had done it in an organized fashion. And so Adventist churches everywhere started collecting money to raise um, enough funds to send a ship over to the Pitcairn Islands. Mm. So there were, there were kids who were making popcorn balls and selling them for a penny a piece. Everything to raise money just for this important project. And that was the beginning of the organized um, 13th Sabbath mission offerings from that point on. So for a hundred years, Adventists have been giving to specific projects as well as just to the general mission fund of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Yes, I remember doing that as a little girl and you probably did too. I certainly did. Well. Thank you so much for joining us um, to talk about this because it is a special uh, it is a special anniversary and we have a video clip coming up soon to focus on this but uh, if you are interested in how you can give your mission offerings you can give it at church every sabbath or you can just go to adventistmission.org and there you can give your mission offerings online and mission offerings go to all aspects of the mission of the church it helps missionaries to work in different parts of the world, global mission pioneers, uh, our internet work, our media work, our humanitarian work, everything is supported in some way through the various mission offerings. But let's now go to this video that focuses on this historic occasion and this 100th anniversary. <laughs> The 13th Sabbath offering doesn't mark the beginning of mission giving in the Adventist Church. Adventists have been giving mission offerings for more than 25 years. The General Conference of uh, School Department decided that uh, there ought to be this project to send a vessel out to the Pacific Ocean to go to the islands. And uh, so they uh, got an appropriation which didn't cover the cost. But then they invited the, mostly the children of the church to help raise funds to build a ship that uh, would go out to all the islands of the Pacific Ocean. And in 1890, that ship sailed from San Francisco and a month later landed at Pitcairn, its first stop. Virtually everyone on the island above the age of majority was baptized. The truth is that all of the Pacific Ocean was affected by the ship Pitcairn and the missionaries who went out. Nearly a hundred missionaries uh, in the different voyages that uh, uh, went on the Pitcairn. So it was, it was a momentous project that grew from just an idea and one man having the burden that we must go uh, as Matthew 28, 19 tells us to do. Go, go, go. Well, of course, the the offering for the ship Pitcairn was the first Sabbath school project of the church. And uh, years later, when uh, the church decided that uh, that had been a good thing, they uh, then took up the idea of a periodic offering uh, that would be very special and, and meet special needs in the church. And that became the 13th Sabbath offering of the Sabbath school department. But in 1912, the General Conference voted to start a special project called 13th Sabbath Offering, in which the church would focus on a special project every quarter. When we have a special offering that we're all going to come together to give, we get closer to each other in doing that. The first 13th Sabbath projects tended to feature general areas of the world, such as the work in Central Africa, but very quickly, the work began to focus on specific projects, such as the River Plate Secondary School, which eventually became their college, and on the Adventist Training School in Chile, which eventually became their university. Well, the Mission Quarterly actually started as a simple eight-page leaflet in which the mission offering was focused on and a couple little stories were initiated and most of it was encouraging people to give to mission offerings. This helped the church in the world know that they were not isolated, that, they, that we needed to grow 
and the 13th Sabbath offering because it focused on projects, helped us understand the need to give, to help specific people in specific places around the world. Jesus reached people through stories. And today, we reach people through stories. The mission stories are told in such a way that we can visualize the individual or the group involved so that we can feel their pain and feel their joys, understand their challenges, and rejoice in their opportunities. The mission stories are to make us identify with others, to want to pray for them, and to want to give, to make their challenges into opportunities that will reach the world. Adventists had to learn to be mission-minded. It didn't come naturally, but once people began focusing on mission, the work around the world spread. And although the church began in North America, and in 1912, nearly all Adventists were in North America, today, only 6% are in North America. 94% of all Adventists live outside North America. Most major Adventist institutions started very small, started with offerings such as the 13th Sabbath offering. Um, imagine a little clinic on the shores of the Amazon River that was instituted to treat the indigenous people. Today it is a, it is a fully functioning medical center in a major city that, w that influences thousands of people every year for Christ. That's what our 13th Sabbath offering and our mission offerings do. In the last 100 years, roughly 500 institutions and plans have received money from the 13th Sabbath offering. Imagine the amount of work that can do. Each offering was a seed that is planted somewhere in the world, and each of those seeds has grown from a tiny medical clinic to a great hospital, from a tiny church to a great institution of evangelism. And each of those institutions are like trees that have grown from the seed, and those trees have branched out and planted more seeds. So the cycle continues to grow. Our offerings are seeds. Giving to 13th Sabbath offerings is even more important today than before. Imagine our church at 17 million members and many, many people who attend who are not members yet. Giving to a specific focus, a specific project every quarter. Imagine what we could do if we all gave sacrificially to a specific project. We can pray for that project and we can understand the people who need this work and we can make a huge difference in the world. 13th Sabbath offering projects are not just about brick and mortar. They're about facilitating the outreach to millions of people around the world who would never hear of the gospel. We may build a clinic in some far off country. It's not the building, it's the doctors and nurses treating people in need. And that's what mission is about. World mission isn't just another pot into which we cast coins. It is God's commission telling us to go. Every quarter, Adventist Mission produces an inspiring collection of video mission stories and reports for the Adventist Mission DVD. If you live in North America and would like to receive a free sample copy of the Adventist Mission DVD, then call or visit our website and ask for a sample Adventist Mission DVD or request offer number 303. Please remember to clearly state your name, full address, and don't forget to mention the Adventist Mission DVD or offer 303. Well, that's it for today's program. Thank you so much for your continuing prayerful support of Global Mission and your weekly mission offerings. As we finish this program, please watch this music video and take time to talk to our Father about how you can be involved in His mission to share the good news of His love. 
Until next time, I'm Gary Krause, wishing you God's richest blessing. Pour saber quem tu és, teu poder, tua glória, eu me inclino a teus pés, Senhor. Por saber quem sou, meu sofrer. Stop.